Hey everyone, Professor Maxwell here. Um, if you're seeing this, you logged on to Canvas and you're in module seven, and hopefully you saw my announcement. Um, I'm pre-recording this because I will be uh, at a conference on Monday. So we're doing this a little unorthodoxly, but I'm doing you the best where we, uh, Hopefully you still get similar experience to what we get, would have gotten in class. Um, and uh, as you can see, we're starting on chapter seven this week. Um, exam one, we just finished and we had covered essentially some of the basics of chemistry, which are you know some of the concepts of an atom what an atom is some of the more basic concepts protons neutrons and electrons um, molar mass chemical properties of different elements things like that and this chapter we're going to get into a little bit more detail on the structure of an atom with respect to mostly the electrons um, in this chapter we'll be looking at uh, you know, the different energies of electrons um, and how these energies affect the chemical properties of atoms and how we can observe different changes in the energies. Um, and, you know, one uh, way we can see this, and we may have seen this in our daily lives, is uh, if you've ever seen fireworks before. And uh, this is one good example where uh, you know, fireworks, they can come in many different colors, like red, green, blue, um, gold, all different colors. And the colors produced by a firework are from burning different metals that are in the gunpowder in the firework. And the reason why these metals produce different colors is because they have electrons with different energies. And it's those electrons that are emitting the light that we see um, when we shoot fireworks off. Um, if we, uh, you know, throw some of these metals in a fire, we can see this picture here on the first slide where we've got uh, basically some different salts of different metals that are burning and we can see uh, they're producing different colors, right? We can see green, uh, some orange, some red, and each of these colors is produced by a different metal. And those metals have electrons of different energies. And when those electrons uh, release energy due to being you know, heated up, burning in the flame, we see different colors. Uh, so we'll be learning about, again, the properties of electrons, the properties of light in general, um, because light uh, the color of you know, light that we see uh, is dependent on the energy of that light. Um, so we'll be learning a bit about the electromagnetic spectrum, about what wavelengths of light we can see, as well as the other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, such as UV light, you know, infrared light, microwaves, those kind of things. You may have heard before, but uh, we'll be talking a bit more in detail on those. And as well as how we can calculate uh, the energy of light given the color, um, and also what colors would be produced by different atoms uh, given the energies of their electrons. Okay, so this is all chapter seven. Um, and I know we were on chapter three, now we're going to chapter seven, but um, this is, again, just more about the structure of the atom more in detail. Uh, so we're going to get right into it. And first slide here, I always put the goals of the chapter. Um, a lot of things that I had just described are here. First, we'll be talking about electromagnetic radiation in general. So electromagnetic radiation, you can just think of that as light, okay? Um, light comes in many different forms, and we'll be talking about, again, the, the properties of light um, and the different uh, spectrums of light, those kinds of things, because those will extend to electrons as well. 
okay? And electrons can, you can think of them as a particle. We can also think of them as more of a wave. And we'll be talking about those ideas of wave particle duality, and as well as uh, what's called quantum mechanics. Basically, where can we find an electron in an atom? Like where physically in space is the electron? Because it's not just a sphere around the uh, nucleus of the atom, which we commonly think about. Um, you know, sometimes we see, uh, I like drawing this picture, so this is why I'm drawing it. You know, sometimes we see like this kind of thing where we have the nucleus in the center and then we have the electrons just sort of orbiting, you know, around that and sort of like a planetary model, which really isn't the case for. Uh, how these things work in reality. Um, you can think of it more as uh, a cloud type shape where you have the nucleus here and then you have an area around the nucleus where we can find an electron because we're going to treat them more as waves than as particles and we'll be referring to different areas around the nucleus where we could find an electron. They don't, they're not going to follow a specific path, um, something like this. So this is really not the case. This is where uh, it's actually going to look like. Okay. So we're going to talk about that and uh, what those areas in space look like and generally where we can find an electron around an atom. So um, first off, we're going to look at uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Um, let me make sure my screen is still sharing here. Sorry, I feel like sometimes this thing doesn't share properly. Okay, so I think we're good here. Um, so if this doesn't get recorded that I'm sharing the screen, I'm gonna have to do it all over. So uh, pardon me if I, uh, yeah, just making sure that's there. Okay, uh, cause I'm by myself here. I can't ask you guys if I'm sharing the screen because uh, I am recording this um, at my home. So anyway, uh, so electromagnetic radiation, first thing we're gonna talk about. Um, and like I said, uh, light, you can think of light as being a photon. You may, you may have heard that term before, photon. This is more of like the particle type of thing where you can think of traveling more in a straight line. But uh, all light does act as a wave, okay, or as waves. And waves have different parts. And we're going to first talk about these different parts of a wave. Um, the most important of which we can see here, we're going to denote as wavelength, frequency, and speed, okay? There are other parts such as amplitude, um, that we'll briefly talk about. Uh, but the most important things for us in this chapter are gonna be wavelength, frequency, and, and speed. And I think everyone knows what speed is, how fast it's traveling. We know light travels basically faster than anything else. Um, and the, so the speed of light, we're gonna abbreviate as C, and you may have, seen this C before, if you've seen uh, E equals MC squared, right? Einstein's famous equation. Okay, so that's this C, same C, and that's the speed of light, okay? So we'll be going into that in a little bit more detail, um, but this is gonna be a constant for us uh, when we're talking about the speed of light because um, it, it does not change, okay? So uh, C, constant speed of light, you can think of all light traveling at the same speed, but they will have different wavelengths and different frequencies, okay? So the wavelength we're going to abbreviate as lambda, looks like a little inverted Y there, it's called a lambda, you know, Greek letter, right? And what the wavelength is, we can see the picture here is just the distance between two peaks on the wave, okay? How close together are two peaks on the wave, okay? And length 
is, as you may know, the distance, right? So we'll be talking about wavelength in units of meters or more often nanometers, okay? We use nanometers quite a lot to talk about light because the distance between the waves is very small for most light waves, especially visible light. Um, so we're using the term nanometer because nano is one billionth of a meter. Okay, so generally visible light between you know 400 and 600 nanometers. Um, and we use that because it's more convenient to talk about it uh, with nanometers because again, very small distance. Okay, so this is our wavelength. And lastly, our frequency is how many peaks of a wave can travel through a point at a given period of time, okay? Um, I think I have a better picture on this slide. Here we go. Uh, so wavelength and frequency uh, are sort of dependent on each other, where if our wavelength is shorter, our frequency is going to be greater or higher, okay? Because all of the light is traveling at the same speed. So if our peaks are closer together, then we'll have more of those peaks traveling through a point than if the peaks are longer than uh, for a longer wavelength. We can see two different wavelengths of light here. Um, the first one, this would be a long wavelength, okay? So it would have a smaller frequency. The next one would be a shorter wavelength and it would have a higher frequency, okay? Um, and we'll do over some more examples of this as well. Uh, but the energy of a light wave or a photon, you could say, is also going to vary with the frequency and the wavelength, okay? And energy also related to color as well. So we'll be talking about different colors of visible light. You know, if you've ever seen a rainbow or something like that, you know, the diffraction of light. So it's basically separating the light waves by their wavelength or by their frequency. So do you know the order of the rainbow? Uh, we can go the order of wavelength or frequency sort of based off of that. And we see a, a maybe a little bit better picture here of some different colors of light. Again, here, think about the rainbow where you have red on the top and then you know blue, violet on the bottom. Okay, so this is basically the order of the wavelengths of light. And red light, basically high wavelength, longer wavelength. And as you go down, to blue, purple, the wavelength becomes shorter, okay? So we see the two peaks here, the distance is much shorter. You can see the distance here, much shorter between those two peaks for the blue light than between these two peaks for the red light, okay? And if we took a, a, an area here, like say we're looking at this area, frequency is how many peaks there would be in that specific area. So for our frequency here, we see one, two, three, four peaks, right? So we could say the frequency is around four, this one frequency three, and this one frequency would be two. So as we can see, as our wavelength decreases, frequency is going to increase. Sorry, it's a bad four. There we go. A little bit better four. Um, and those we can say are basically inversely proportional. Again, as frequency decreases, wavelength increases, and vice versa. And I told you we were going to talk a little bit about amplitude. Um, this is one example of amplitude, which is just the magnitude of the wave. You can think of how bright is the light. Um, so greater amplitude means just the peak 
is going to be physically greater or higher than with less amplitude. So we would see a brighter light, okay? But we won't re be really calculating amplitude um, in this course, but we should still know what it means, uh, what it means to have brighter light, okay? And again, this is our amplitude. Frequency is lambda there, or sorry, wavelength is lambda. And we'll again be going over how we can calculate uh, these two quantities, okay? And this is the equation that we're gonna be using to calculate our wavelength and our frequency, okay? And the equation here is C is equal to wavelength times frequency, okay? Um, and this, uh, again, C is gonna be constant which is our speed of light, okay? And we can see the units are in meters per second. And again, C is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. And we'll go over a couple examples on how to do this. Um, and one cool sort of practical example of the speed of light is, you know, we, we know Florida does get a lot of lightning storms. I think it is the, you know, the lightning capital of the United States, um, maybe even of the world. I'm not exactly sure on that, but definitely the United States, it gets the most uh, lightning, most thunder out of any other place. And if one thing you may have noticed in a lightning storm is that we always see the lightning before we hear the thunder, okay? You always see the flash first, or sometimes we don't even see it, um, but if we do see it, we're, we're always hearing the thunder come after the lightning, okay? And that's because sound travels much slower than light does, okay? So our light here, we're gonna be using the constant for C is equal to three times 10 to the eight meters per second, which means um, this is the speed that the light is traveling uh, in meters per second. So extremely, extremely fast. This is per second, y'all. So super, super fast. Whereas sound is only 340 meters per second. So, you know, still fast, right? But not nearly as fast as light is. And this is why we see the light from lightning before we hear the thunder. You can actually measure how far away a lightning strike is by the time difference on seeing the lightning versus hearing the thunder, okay? I've been told that um, for every one second difference, that's equal to basically one mile away uh, the lightning is. So if there's a big difference there, that means the lightning is super far away the lightning is very close to you, there's much less of a difference. You'll see the light, you'll hear the, hear the thunder right afterwards, okay? But the key thing here is that the speed of light is a constant three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Um, this constant, you know, this, that's gonna be given to uh, everyone on their uh, exam as a constant. So you won't have to memorize that, but after doing many of these problems, we should be pretty familiar with this constant, okay? So let's do a couple examples here where we're calculating uh, the frequency or the wavelength of some different light, um, different light photons or different light waves, you could say, okay? So first one here is we're, we've got the wavelength um, or we want the wavelength of orange light, and we're told that the frequency is 4.8 times 10 to the 14 S negative one, okay? And the units here, S negative one, this is the same thing as one over S, where S is seconds. You could say one over seconds um, and this is also the same thing as Hertz, okay? So you may have seen Hertz before, 
you know, on your Wi-Fi router or something, you know, five gigahertz um, or 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, and again, this is just the frequency of the signal being produced by your Wi-Fi router. So you, your Wi-Fi router does use light and you know, it's not visible light, we can't see it, but it is still a wave, light wave, and it does have a very high frequency. Um, you know, we can only see certain frequencies of light that are in the visible range. This one, not in the visible range, we can't see it, but it does have a frequency um, of five gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. So you may have seen, you know, some of these frequencies before, uh, but Hertz, the key thing here is that Hertz is the same thing as S negative one or one over S, which is one over seconds. Okay, so just remember that we are using this equation where C, you know, meters per second or meter S negative one, which is the same thing as meters over seconds, right? And that's equal to your wavelength times the frequency. Okay, so here we're given frequency. So we're just going to plug that in to our frequency, the little uh, V, this is called nu. It's not actually a V, again, another Roman numeral. So we're just gonna plug that in. We've got our C, remember C is a constant um, of three times 10 to the eight, and we're gonna solve for frequency, okay? And just a couple things to keep in mind here is that when we're solving with this equation, our wavelength here is in meters, okay? Because we have meters for our light, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Because our light has units of meters, our frequency is going to be in meters when we solve this, okay? So, um, you know, sometimes we'll be asked to convert to nanometers, but uh, we'll always do that after we solve this equation, okay? Or if we're given the light in nanometers, we always gonna have to convert to meters first so that we can cancel the meters that are in our speed of light. Okay, so uh, key thing, you know, make sure you're paying attention to the units here. That's sort of what I'm trying to get you guys to focus on. So let's solve this one. Um, you know, we can rearrange this equation. If we have C is equal to wavelength times our frequency, and if we want to solve for the wavelength, then we can just divide both by our frequency, and that's gonna cancel the frequency. And what we get is C over frequency is going to be equal to wavelength, okay? So we can rearrange this equation. And again, our C is a constant, we've got that one, we've got our frequency. So we're just gonna plug the values in there and we can get our wavelength, okay? And again, make sure that your units are canceling here. So we see these two S negative one seconds, those cancel. And again, what we solve for is in meters. So we just take our C, you know, we can use three times 10 to the eight or 2.998 or 2.99. Again, you're gonna get something very similar because you're just um, you're sort of rounding it a little bit. Um, I'm okay if you guys use C is equal to three times 10 to the eight. Um, that's essentially gonna give you the same answer here, but we're just dividing our speed of light by the frequency, and this is going to give you your wavelength, okay? And then, Again, we can convert this into nanometers. We just have to remember what is our conversion factor for nanometers, okay? 
And again, your conversion factor here for nano is one over one billion. Okay, one billion with a B nanometers in a meter. Okay, so, you know, we should, again, remember our metric prefixes. We won't really have to know anything beyond nano. Nano is essentially the smallest metric prefix that we should know. Remember your milli is one over 1,000. Your micro, which is a U, not a V. Whoops, sorry, my electronic pen is sometimes not the best. Um, so micro keeps doing that. Uh, one over one million. And your nano is one over one billion. Okay. I think my connection here is a little funky. Sorry, my pen keeps lagging out. Um, so just know your metric prefixes. Again, we'll be using nano quite often here. Um, so keep that one in mind. One billion, same as 10 to the nine, okay? So again, that's where that one comes from. So we divide um, that one and we can convert our wavelength into nanometers. And again, we use nanometers quite often in this chapter because it's going to give us a nice whole number. You know, we can see that th this one looks much better than this one because we don't have any scientific notation, okay? So we really want to use this one nano when we can, just because it looks better, it's easier to read without the scientific notation. Okay, let's move on to another practice problem. And here we've got our wavelength and we want to calculate frequency, okay? So, you know, you guys can pause the video here for a second and try and work this problem. Um, it's a little, uh, usually, you know, I would give you guys time in class to try some of these, but because we're, um, you know, doing the video thing here or the pre recorded thing, you know, just again, pause at this point and try and calculate this one uh, on your own. And you can restart the video. You guys are probably already skipping around. You might be skipping past this right now. That's okay. Um, so, again, we're using the same equation C is equal to wavelength times frequency. And we've got our wavelength. But the key thing is, is that we will first have to convert this into meters before we can plug it into the equation, okay? And again, the reason for that is our C has units of meters per second. I don't know why I put a three there, it should have been an S. Has units of meters per second, okay? So we do need meters for our wavelength, right? This has to be in meters and this one has to be one over seconds. And again, that's the same thing as S negative one. Okay, those are the same. So first thing we want to do is convert two meters. Okay, and then we can just plug into the equation. So I'll just show you guys that. I'll show you guys how I would set this up if I was doing this on paper. Okay, so 255 nanometers. And again, when we do our conversion, I like to do this block style. Again, but this is just multiplying by a conversion factor. And we want nanometers there and meters there because again, we want those nanometers to cancel. So I have to have nanometers there, meters on the top. And again, we just have to remember how many nanometers are in a meter, right? One billion, okay? So we can put one billion here, uh, one times 10 to the nine nanometers per meter, okay? So that's one way to write this, or you could say that one nanometer is equal to one one billionth 
of a meter. Okay, so this is one, one billionth over one. So you get the same way or the same answer doing it that way. You know, I do prefer to think about it as again, one billion nanometers in a meter. I just think that's easier to do. And we can see the nanometers cancel, right? So when we multiply this out, uh, we could just say 255 times 10 to the negative nine. This isn't really the proper way to do scientific notation. Really your number should be, be between one and 10. So if you type this into your calculator, what you should see is 2.55 times 10 to the negative seven meters, okay? But this is again, the same number there. Um, but I think, you know, just for the sake of easiness, we can do it the top way, okay? So we can, we do that conversion and then we plug it into our equation. Um, here we're solving for frequency. So we just change the equation around. We have wavelength times frequency. So if we divide both sides by wavelength, right, those cancel. So what we're left with is frequency is equal to speed times or speed over wavelength, okay? So again, this is our constant and our 255 nanometers is our wavelength. So we just divide the two, as you can see here. And again, the units for our frequency that we get are gonna be S negative one, which is again, the same thing as Hertz. Okay, so what we should see 1.18 times 10 to the 15 S negative one, or we could say 1.18 times 10 to the 15 Hertz, okay? Same unit, or you could say they're interchangeable. Okay, so moving on, now that we've had a little bit of practice interconverting our wavelength and our frequency, we want to start talking about energy. Okay, what is the energy of the light? And we'll be talking about the different um, different electromagnetic uh, spectrums later on, uh, but we do know that light does have different energies. Um, one way you could think about this is, you know, we, we all know that UV light, ultraviolet, is bad for your skin. Okay, um, because that light has much more energy in it than you know, your regular visible light. And that extra energy does damage our skin. And that's why we get sunburns if we stand out in the sun for too long without any sunscreen, okay? So it's that extra energy that is harmful for us, okay? And we can relate the energy of light to its frequency and its wavelength using this equation here, okay? Uh, what we see here is big E, which is our energy, the energy of the light, or the energy of one photon of light is equal to H, and H here is our Planck's constant, okay? So, Another constant, again, this one will also be given to you guys. Don't need to memorize this constant, but this is our constant for converting frequency or wavelength of light into energy, okay? So we have the constant times the frequency. And we can see here that because we're multiplying these two, that as our frequency increases, our energy also increases, okay? So if frequency goes up, energy goes up, okay? Um, and we can also rearrange this thing because we don't have wavelength uh, in this uh, equation here, but say we have, or say we're given the wavelength and a question, um, then we can rearrange this and substitute in 
our uh, previous equation, okay? And that gives us a wavelength into the equation. And just to show you guys what this looks like, right? We have, I'm gonna put both equations here, right? And so this is our energy and this is our wavelength times frequency, okay? So what we can do is if we solve for frequency, okay? So I'm going to solve for frequency here. So we have C over wavelength is equal to frequency. Well, if we just substitute this in here, then we get E is equal to H times C over frequency. We can just you know extend this over and just put it as you know, HC over frequency. Okay, and that's generally what we see um, or how we see this written on the PowerPoint. So again, these two are the same, right? We're just substituting our C over frequency for our lambda in that equation. Okay, so you can use either way of the either form of the equation there just depends on, again, what sort of information that we're given in the question, which one we want to use. Okay. So moving on, as I said, we're going to talk about the different um, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And you can think of the electromagnetic spectrum as being all of the wavelengths of light. Okay, and remember light is not just visible light. You know, we have different forms of light. We have UV light, we can see UV here. And these are arranged in order of both the energy as well as the wavelength. Okay, so we have wavelength here on the bottom and frequency here on the top, as well as energy increasing going from right to left because again, as we go um, moving to the left here, we can see our frequency increases, but our wavelength decreases. And remember, those are inversely proportional. As frequency increases, wavelength decreases. But our energy is also going to increase with the frequency. Remember, frequency increasing energy also increases, okay? So we only really have a very small portion of this as being our visible light. And again, this is uh, from wavelengths of 400 to 700 nanometers, but we have a lot other types of light. And again, the, the most common example would be UV light and Again, this is light that's damaging to our skin because it does, we can see, have more energy than the visible light, okay? But we also have X-ray light. Um, again, this one you may have heard before. Uh, if you've ever taken an X-ray or anything like that in the doctor, doctor's office, or you know, you're getting your teeth X-rayed, um, they do use a, a specific kind of light for that that has even more energy than your UV light. And this is why, you know, if, you, if ever you've gotten your teeth x-rayed or something like that, you always have to wear, you know, this heavy uh, vest or heavy jacket type of thing uh, over your body because you don't want your whole body exposed to these x-rays because they can be damaging to you um, because they do have so much energy, right? And you know, one thing is they should say that um, you should not get too many uh, CAT scans or things like that at the doctor's office. Because if you keep getting scanned uh, by some of these, uh, like a CAT scan or something, you're being bombarded with x-rays uh, getting that scan. And that is really not good for your body. And that's because that, again, those uh, light, photons or those wavelengths of light do have lots of energy. 
So if you get lots of, if you go in and you get lots of CAT scans, um, you do have a higher risk for developing cancers and things like that. Because again, your body's absorbing all of that energy from those x-rays, which is not good for it. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and here we see gamma rays. This is the symbol for gamma. Uh, these are more common in like outer space types of things uh, emitted by stars or you know supernovas, things like that. Um, and they have the most energy. Think of like a cosmic ray, something like that, if you ever heard that term before. Those have the most energy. Uh, I think, you know, our atmosphere on the earth filters most of that stuff out. So we're not actually being hit by gamma rays from stars. But if we were to go into outer space, then yeah, we would be, you know, somewhat concerned about that, um, those types of things. Okay, so gamma rays, most energy. Um, moving to the things that have less energy than visible light, uh, IR or infrared waves. You may have heard that term before, infrared. Um, where do we see these at? Well, if you've ever been to a buffet or um, you know, if you go to some of the dining halls on campus, you'll see that uh, above the food, you have, you know, a big uh, light, often a reddish looking light or heating lamp, right? And there's a special bulb in those lights that gives off a lot of infrared waves. And um, those, uh, when they're absorbed by your food, heat it up. Uh, so that's really the purpose there, to heat up food, um, you know, sometimes, uh, some of the nicer hotel rooms up north, there's stuff like that. They'll have the bulbs in the bathroom because, again, it can be very cold. So those are just to provide extra warmth or something when you're getting out of the shower or something like that. OK, um, but this is infrared and, again, used for heating things. Um, next up, microwave. Again, another common uh wave that we should be familiar with because everyone probably has a microwave or has used a microwave at some point. Uh, so just a different wavelength of light being emitted by your microwave. And again, those heat up food or cook food by uh, basically causing the water to start vibrating in your food, which heats it up. Okay. But it does have, you know, a shorter uh, or lower frequency than our visible light, okay? So infrared, microwave, and then we have some different radio waves that have, uh, you know, basically the least energy or longest wavelength out of the spectrum. And we know radio waves, uh, they're basically everywhere, right? Um, and they don't really hurt us. Uh, you know, we're being bombarded with radio waves all the time, uh, but they don't hurt us. You know, again, cell phone towers, uh, FM, AM radio, those kinds of things are all around us all the time, but they don't seem to hurt us because they don't really have much energy, okay? Uh, that's why they can pass through, you know, a building and just keep going because they really don't have much energy not much is going to absorb uh, those waves, okay? So those are the least energetic, or you could say the longest wavelength. We can see eight meters, six meters on some of them. Um, so long wavelength, low energy, right? And that's why they don't hurt us, okay? You know, everyone says 5G causes cancer. It doesn't. Um, there's no studies that have shown that it just doesn't have uh, enough energy to harm our cells, okay? So there's really no evidence uh, that has ever shown that, okay? So basically just know the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. I think this is kind of cool, um, you know, light, always sort of interesting, the different kinds of light. Uh, I'm not expecting you guys to know 
the individual wavelengths or frequencies for these things, but just know the order of the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, you should know that, you know, UV light has more energy than visible light, that's kind of things. But I'm not expecting you to know that, okay, well, the frequency of UV lights around 10 to the 16, you know, not expecting you to memorize that, just, you know, the order, basically, okay? So moving on, I think we probably have time on this recording. So I want to make this, you know, around the same time or around the same length as the class time. So, um, you know, we can, we'll be picking this up on Wednesday in class. Uh, so we probably have time for another example here. And this one, we're asked to calculate the energy now of, um, light of a specific wavelength okay and you know no one really uses compact disc players before uh you know you guys may have never even owned a compact disc player but um if every if anyone's used a cd player before if they have a cd player uh in their car the that cd player uses a laser to read the grooves on the cd you know, Blu-ray players work the same way, DVD players, any sort of optical disc player, they all have a laser in them. And that laser is looking at the very, very small grooves that are etched into that CD. And that's where it gets the information to play your movie or play a song, those kinds of things. Okay, um, so for a regular compact disc player, uh, the wavelength of light of that laser is given here, 685 nanometers. And what we're being asked is, what is the energy of one photon of this laser beam? And also, what is the energy of one mole of photons of this laser beam? Okay, so we're going to do part A first, and then part B. So if you're watching this at home, maybe press pause right now, try and work this one out. Uh, again, the equation that we're going to be using is E is equal to H nu. But here, because we have wavelengths, we can rewrite this as HC over lambda, or Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by wavelength, okay? So try this one out. Uh, we're going to start, again, going over it right now. But hopefully you guys, again, practice these at home for yourself. Don't just, you know, watch the video and then that's all. Uh, you know, pause the video, work out the problem, then unpause, check your work. This is what y'all should be doing when you're uh, studying anyway, okay? Um, and not to change the subject, but uh, if you guys haven't looked at my announcement that I posted on the canvas on different study strategies, make sure you check that out. Um, it's not very long, uh, you know, but there is a lot of good information there on how to study. And again, this can be helpful for any sort of class, not just this class, it can be applied for any class. And the main thing is, is that you do want to be actively involved. And that means not just watching videos or reading, but you want to be practicing the problems that are in the book, um, taking notes while you read. And again, while you're doing those practice problems, try and use your notes or you know just go off of memory if you can. But um, don't just look everything up in the book. Try and use your notes to answer the problems as you go along, because that's uh, going to help you remember all those concepts better. So, you know, if you haven't seen my announcement regarding that, uh, make sure you check that out. It's in the lecture web course and the announcement. I think I titled it Study Strategies. Uh, so definitely worth a read if you haven't seen that yet. Okay. So back onto this problem. Um, again, what we want to do is first convert from nanometers to meters because 
Again, we want those meters unit to cancel with our speed of light that has units of <clears throat> meters per second. Okay, so we convert the nanometers. You could say you divide by 1 billion here to do that conversion uh, from nanometers to meters. Okay, so again, this should be, again, the first thing that you do, convert those nanometers to meters. Second step, we just plug it into our equation. Again, we're given H, we're given C. Those are both constants. So all we have to do is we plug in our wavelength in for lambda, okay? So our H given, our C given, and this is our H, this is our C, and this is our lambda. Okay, so we just plug all those in, we divide, and we get our energy. And we can see all of the units are going to cancel except for joules, capital J, and joules are going to be our unit for energy. Okay, um, so keep that in mind. This is energy, right, in joules. Okay, so all the units cancel except for joules, which is our energy, right? And the second part of this equation, we're asked how many, how much energy for one mole of photons. So this just requires one additional step where we just have to remember that uh, for one mole of anything, we have Avogadro's number. Right, it doesn't matter if it's atoms, molecules, or photons, it's always going to be Avogadro's number in a mole. Okay, so if we know the energy of one photon, which is what we just calculated, this here, this is the energy of one photon. Okay, one photon. So if we wanted the energy of Avogadro's number of photons, all we have to do is, again, multiply by Avogadro's number, okay? Um, so we take our energy of one photon, we can say this is joules per photon, and we say, okay, we have Avogadro's number of photons per mole. So we multiply those out, we get the energy per mole. And we can see that, you know, we have a, a lot more photons, we do have a lot more energy as well, okay? Because for light of a given wavelength, each photon is going to have the same energy because they will all have the same wavelength. So we multiply it out, our photons cancel, we get our energies per mole, and we can also uh, convert that to kilojoules, right? All we have to do is we say, okay, 1,000 joules per kilojoule. Okay, so, you know, we weren't uh, exactly specified what units to give our energy in. So this would be one where you sort of just have to look at the question. It's a multiple choice type of question, which all of your exam questions will be multiple choice. Just look at the answers. You know, the units will be given on the answer. So if, if all of your answers are in kilojoules, then we have to convert to kilojoules. Um, or look at the question, see whether it specifies what specific unit to cancel or what specific unit the answer should be in. So you just want to convert to that unit, okay? Um, so I think uh, this is probably a good place to stop here for this recording. Um, and we'll be picking this up on Wednesday um, again, this recording will stay on Canvas, uh, so you know you can watch it again as many times as you want, and uh, you know we'll be reviewing over some of this on Wednesday. But uh, because we ha didn't have class on Monday, this is our class. Um, just make sure you guys are again checking the announcements for me. Uh, test grades should be up at some point, either uh, Monday or Tuesday,
there were some people that um, uh, unfortunately got COVID and things like that. So they had their and you know exam extended. Um, so once everyone's taken the exam, the grades will be up there. I'm posting all of the grades at once. Um, so you know, hopefully you guys you know stay safe out there. Keep wearing a mask and things like that. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of students that uh, unfortunately did get COVID. So hopefully they all feel better if you're out there and um, you know my best wishes to you especially to those that got covid or and things like that and um, again if if you're feeling unwell please don't come to class uh, watch the class on zoom that's the whole point of the zoom so that you can you know not uh, risk you know spreading you know whatever it may be in class so just watch on zoom everything's recorded there and uh, you know, if you do feel unwell for an exam, um, you know, please visit the student health center or please visit a doctor and you know, send me whatever you get from that doctor's note or any sort of COVID um, test or anything like that. And I can work with you to you know, reschedule an exam, okay? But I do need to see you know, some sort of documentation of that, um, I can't just get an email saying that oh, I was feeling unwell. You know, I, I need some sort of documentation, okay? Because uh, that's in the syllabus. Um, so, uh, you know, just visit the health center. Just something saying that you were there that day is good enough, but it just has to be some sort of official documentation to show that, you know, you do have an excused absence. Um, so just send me a copy of that, uh, email me a picture, anything like that, and we'll, I'll work with you to uh, help you reschedule or anything like that. Okay, so hope you guys have a great rest of your day, um, and I hope to see y'all in class on Wednesday, and you know, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me, and uh, take care, guys.